Hey guys, I am back on a rather chilly Monday morning, and we're ready for lesson two of our new study. And we're actually going to start our novel today. But before we start our novel, I want to back up and look at what we talked about on um, yesterday from our interesting little one-page story, Shrouded in Myth. So you should have done the uh, quiz by, or the, the little um, thing I gave you by now that um, asked you those questions. We talked about gist. We talked about vocabulary words. And we're going to go through that today. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to go um, look through the story, and there's a link to it um, on the homework assignment for today. Look through the story, and I need you to ask yourself uh what was the gist? Just remember the story. What was the gist of the story? What were some vocabulary words you were missing? And then as you do that, I want you to think about the vocabulary words and their definitions. At the end of the week, we're going to have a little bit of a vocab review exercise. And you should know how to do this by now, reviewing words in context. So words you don't know the meaning of, if you look them up, in the context, you should be able to find it. But that's not the main focus today. The main focus is something we are calling citing evidence. Does that sound exciting? Does it sound like a detective or something? Citing evidence is when we um, are, are looking at a text, we're trying to understand the text, and then we make some conclusions, ideas, um, determinations, inferences about what the text is saying. So I selected five questions for you today that I really want you to think about, but not just think about. You should be able to answer these questions simply by looking at the story. So uh, after you watch this video, which you're watching now, you're awesome. Where's my thumb? There's my thumb. Awesome. Review your answers to the quiz from lesson two about Shrouded in Myth. Review the story for evidence and answer the questions based on what you see in the story. This isn't just pulling answers out of your hat. We like to do that sometimes, just take wild guesses, and that's fine. But what I want you to do now is to look for evidence. So when we cite something, it's a fancy way of saying quoting it or saying, this is what this says, therefore this. So citing evidence. We'll talk about a lot about what that looks like. Citing evidence. And evidence is, of course, uh, proof of what... Um, what we say, uh, of what we think. So let me give you one example here. I always like to lay it out so you guys can see what I'm looking for. Um, let me scoot this over. Doo, doo, doo. Okay. So the first question is, what makes Acrisios so sure he will never have a grandson? Now, we have to go back to the beginning of the story. And, and so I'm going to do that with you. Um, here's a story. So, Acrisiosis, I'm just going to scan the first paragraph here. His grandfather, the king of Argos, was given a prophecy that he would someday be killed by his grandson. To protect him from this fate, the terrified king imprisoned his only daughter, Danae, in an underground dungeon so that she could never marry or have children. Certain that he would never be a grandfather, Acrisios relaxed. Okay, so it says in the text, Acrisios relaxed. So, I'm going to come back over here. And I'm going to look at the question. What makes Acrisios sure he will never have a grandson? So I'm going to say this. In paragraph, let me unbold this just so it's clear. In paragraph one, see how I switch between it? So I want to keep track of what I'm reading. Okay. In paragraph one, this is real time, folks. <laughs> In paragraph one, Acrisios locks up his daughter so she will never marry or have children. Boom. Now, I cited the evidence by saying in paragraph one, this is what happens. And, and I note that um, he locked her up and why he locked her up. That's called citing evidence evidence. So I'm going to delete that now. And it's your turn. I need you to fill out at least three of these five questions. That means you can pick three of the five. Mr. Lang, can we pick the first one you just did and answer it? Absolutely. You can do that. So at least three out of the five to get full credit. Okay. That's what I want you to do. Now, 
Let's move to something totally different. Okay, this is our book, Percy Jackson and the Lightning Thief. Uh, I'm sorry, Percy Jackson and the Olympians. Percy Jackson and the Olympians. Does that look pretty exciting? Does this look like a true story? Does this look like something that really happened? Maybe not, but we'll see and get started. Now, I'm not going to assign anything for you to do from the book today. I just want you to follow along with me. But this is important. I want you, let me set up my screen here. I want you not just to listen, but as much as possible to follow along with the story that I'm reading. In other words, I want you to, bear with me. Okay. I want you to read the text on the one side of your screen while you listen to me reading it. I'm going to read fairly slowly, and you'll have plenty of chance to walk with me. I need you to read out loud in your head while I'm reading. Are you ready to do that? Okay, well, let's go. Chapter one of, there's our book. Chapter one of Rick Riordan's Percy Jackson and the Olympians. I accidentally vaporized my pre-algebra teacher. Look, I didn't want to be a half-blood. If you're reading this because you think you might be one, my advice is close this book right now. Believe whatever lie your mom or dad told you about your birth and try to lead a normal life. Being a half-blood is dangerous. It's scary. Most of the time, it gets you killed in painful, nasty ways. If you're a normal kid reading this because you think it's fiction, great, read on. I envy you for being able to believe that none of this ever happened. But if you recognize yourself in these pages, if you feel something stirring inside, stop reading immediately. You might be one of us. And once you know that, it's only a matter of time before they sense it too. And they'll come for you. Don't say I didn't warn you. My name is Percy Jackson. I'm 12 years old. Until a few months ago, I was a boarding student at Yancey Academy, a private school for troubled kids in upstate New York. Am I a troubled kid? Yeah, you, you could say that. I could start at any point in my short, miserable life to prove it, but things really started going bad last May when our sixth grade class took a field trip to Manhattan. 28 mental case kids and two teachers on a yellow school bus headed to the Metropolitan Museum of Art to look at ancient Greek and Roman stuff. I know, it sounds like torture. Most Yancey field trips were. But Mr. Brunner, our Latin teacher, was leading the trip, so I had hopes. Mr. Brunner was this middle-aged guy in a motorized wheelchair. He had thinning hair and a scruffy beard and a frayed tweed jacket, which always smelled like coffee. You wouldn't think he'd be cool, but he told us stories and jokes and let us play games in class. He also had this awesome collection of Roman armor and weapons, so he was the only teacher whose class didn't put me to sleep. I hoped the trip would be okay. At least, I hoped that for once I wouldn't get in trouble. Boy, I was wrong. See... Bad things happen to me on field trips. Like at my fifth grade school, when we went to the Saratoga battlefield, I had this accident with a Revolutionary War cannon. I, I wasn't aiming for the school bus, but of course I got expelled anyway. And before that, at my fourth grade school, when we took a behind-the-scenes tour of the Marine World Shark Pool, I sort of hit the wrong lever on the catwalk, and our class took an unplanned swim. And the time before that, well, you get the idea. This trip, I was determined to be good all the way in this, into the city, I put up with Nancy Bobofit, the, freckle, the freckly red-headed kleptomaniac girl hitting my best friend Grover in the back of the head with chunks of peanut butter and ketchup sandwich. Grover was an easy target. He was scrawny. He cried when he got frustrated. He must have been held back several grades because he was the only sixth grader with acne and the start of a wispy beard on his chin. On top of all of that, he was crippled. He had a note excusing him from P.E. for the rest of his life because he had some kind of muscular disease in his legs. He walked funny like every step hurt him, but don't let that fool him. You should have seen him run when it was enchilada day at the cafeteria. Anyway, 
Nancy Boba Fett was throwing wads of sandwich that stuck in, in, in his curly brown hair, and she knew I couldn't do anything back to her because I was already on probation. The headmaster had threatened me with death by in-school suspension if anything bad, embarrassing, or evenly mildly entertaining happened on this trip. I'm going to kill her, I mumbled. Grover tried to calm me down. It's okay, I like peanut butter. He dodged another piece of Nancy's lunch. That's it! I started to get up, but Grover pulled me back to my seat. You're already on probation, he reminded me. You know you'll, you'll get blamed if anything happens. Look on, looking back on it, I wish I'd decked Nancy Boba Fett right then and there. In-school suspension would have been nothing compared to the mess I was about to get myself into. Mr. Brunner led the museum tour. He rode up front in his wheelchair, guiding us through the big echoey galleries, past marble statues and glass cases full of really old black and orange pottery. It blew my mind that this stuff had survived for 2,000, 3,000 years. He gathered us around a 13-foot tall stone column with a big sphinx on the top and started telling us how it was a grave marker, a stele, for a girl about our age. He told us about the carvings on the side. I was trying to listen to what he had to say because it was kind of interesting, but everybody around me was talking, and every time I told them to shut up, the other teacher chaperone, Mrs. Dodds, would give me the evil eye. Mrs. Dodds was this little math teacher from Georgia who always wore a black leather jacket even though she was 50 years old. She looked mean enough to ride a Harley right into your locker. She had come to Yancey halfway through the year when our last math teacher had had a ner nervous breakdown. From her first day, Mrs. Dodds loved Nancy Boba Fett and figured I was the devil's spawn. She would point her crooked finger at me and say, Now, honey, real sweet, and I knew I was going to get after-school detention for a month. One time, after she'd made me erase answers out of old math workbooks until midnight, I told Grover I didn't think Mrs. Dodds was human. He looked at me, real serious, and said, You're absolutely right. Mr. Brunner kept talking about Greek funeral art. Finally, Nancy Boba Fett snickered something about the naked guy on the stele, and I turned around and said, Will you shut up? It came out louder than I meant it to be. The whole group laughed. Mr. Brunner stopped his story. Mr. Jackson, he said, did you have a comment? My face was totally red. I said, no, sir. Mr. Brunner pointed to one of the pictures on the stele. Perhaps you'll tell us what this picture represents. I looked at the carving and felt a flush of relief because I actually recognized it. That's Kronos eating his kids, right? Yes, said Mr. Brunner, obviously not satisfied. And he did this because, well, I racked my brain to remember. Kronos was the king god and god, Mr. Brunner asked. Titan, I corrected myself, and he didn't trust his kids who were the gods, so um, Kronos ate them, right? But his wife had baby Zeus and gave Kronos a rock to eat instead. And later, when Zeus grew up, he grew up, he tricked his dad, Kronos, into barfing up his brothers and sisters. Ew, said one of the girls behind me. And so there was this big fight between the gods and the titans, I continued, and the gods won. Some snickers from the group. Behind me, Nancy Baba Fit mumbled to a friend, Like we're going to use this in real life? Like it's going to stay on our job applications? Please explain why Kronos ate his kids. And why, Mr. Jackson Brunner said, To paraphrase Ms. Baba Fit's excellent question, Does this matter in real life? Busted, Grover muttered. Shut up, Nancy hissed, her face even brighter red than her hair. At least Nancy got packed too. Mr. Brunner was the only one who ever caught her saying anything wrong. He had radar ears. I thought about his question and shrugged. I don't know, sir. I see. Mr. Brunner looked disappointed. Well, half credit, Mr. Jackson. Zeus did, in feed, did indeed feed Kronos a mixture of mustard and wine, which made him disgorge his five other children, which of course became immortal gods, having been living and growing up completely undigested in the titan's stomach. The gods defeated their father, sliced him to pieces with his own scythe, and scattered his remains in Tartarus, the darkest part of the underworld. On that happy note, it's time for lunch. Mrs. Dodds, would you lead us back outside? The class drifted off, the girls holding their stomachs, the guys pushing each other around and acting like doofuses. Grover and I were about to follow when Mr. Brunner said, Mr. Jackson. I knew that was coming. I told Grover to keep going. Then I turned toward Mr. Brunner. Sir, Mr. Brunner had this look that wouldn't let you go. 
intense brown eyes that could have been a thousand years old and had seen everything. You must learn the answer to my question, Mr. Brunner told me. About the Titans? About real life and how your studies apply to it. Oh, what you learn from me, he said, is vitally important. I expect you to treat it as such. I will accept only the best from you, Percy Jackson. I wanted to get angry. This guy pushed me so hard. I mean, sure, it was kind of cool on tournament days when he dressed up in a suit of Roman armor and shouted, What ho! and challenged a sword point against chalk to run to the board and name every Greek and Roman person who had ever lived, and their mother, and what god they worshipped. But Mr. Brunner expected me to be as good as everybody else, despite the fact that I have dyslexia and attention deficit disorder and never made above a C- in my life. No, he didn't expect me to be as good. He expected me to be better. And I just couldn't learn all those names and facts, much less spell them correctly. I mumbled something about trying harder while Mr. Brunner took one long, sad look at the stele, just as he'd been, like he'd been at this girl's funeral. He told me to go outside and eat my lunch. The class gathered on the front steps of the museum, where we could watch the foot traffic along Fifth Avenue. Overhead, a huge storm was brewing with clouds blacker than I'd ever seen over, over the city. I figured maybe it was global warming or something because the weather all across New York State had been weird since Christmas. We'd had massive snowstorms, flooding, wildfires from lightning strikes. I wouldn't have been surprised if this was a hurricane blowing in. No one else seemed to notice. Some of the guys were pelting pigeons with Lunchable crackers. Nancy Boba Fett was trying to pickpocket something from a lady's purse, and of course, Mrs. Dodds wasn't seeing a thing. Grover and I sat on the edge of the fountain away from the others. We thought that maybe if we did that, everybody wouldn't know we were from that school, the school for loser freaks who couldn't make it elsewhere. Detention? Grover asked. Nah, I said, not from Bronner. I just wish he'd lay off me sometimes. I mean... I'm not a genius. Grover didn't say anything for a while. Then, when I thought he was going to give some, me some deep philosophical comment to make me feel better, he said, Can I have your apple? I didn't have much of an appetite, so I let him take it. I watched the stream of cabs going down Fifth Avenue and thought about my mom's apartment only a little ways uptown from where we sat. I hadn't seen her since Christmas. I wanted so bad to jump in a taxi and head home. She'd hug me and be glad to see me, but she'd be disappointed too. She'd send me right back to Yancey, remind me that I had to try harder, even if this was my sixth school in six years and I was probably going to get kicked out again. I wouldn't be able to stand that sad look she'd give me. Mr. Brunner parked his wheelchair at the base of the handicapped ramp. He ate celery while he read a paperback novel. A red umbrella stuck up from the back of his chair, making it look like a motorized cafe table. I was about to unwrap my sandwich when Nancy Boba Fett appeared in front of me with her ugly friends. I guess she'd gotten tired of stealing from the tourists and dumped her half-eaten lunch in Grover's lap. Oops, she grinned at me with her crooked teeth. Her freckles were orange at his, as if somebody had spray-painted her face with liquid Cheetos. I tried to stay cool. The school counselor had told me a million times, Count to ten, get control of your temper. But I was so mad my mind went blank. A wave roared in my ears. I don't remember touching her, but the next thing I knew, Nancy was sitting on her butt in the fountain screaming, Percy, push me! Mrs. Dodds materialized next to us. Some of the kids were whispering, Did you see the water? Like, like it grabbed her! I didn't know what they were talking about. All I knew was that I was in trouble again. As soon as Mrs. Dodds was sure, per li poor little Nancy was okay, promising to get her a new short shirt at the museum gift shop, etc., etc., Mrs. Dodds turned on me. There was a triumphant fire in her eyes, as if something she'd been waiting for all semester. Now, honey, I know I grumbled, a month erasing workbooks. That wasn't the right thing to say. Come with me, Mrs. Dodds said. Wait, Grover yelled. Yelped. It was me. I pushed her. I stared at him, stunned. I couldn't believe he was trying to cover for me. Mrs. Dodd scared Grover to death. She glared at him so hard his whiskery chin trembled. I don't think so, Mr. Underwood, she said. But you will stay here. Grover looked at me desperately. It's okay, man. Thanks for trying. Honey, 
Mrs. Dodds barked at me. Now! Nancy Baba Fitz smirked. I gave her my deluxe I'll kill you later stare. Then I turned to face Mrs. Dodds, but she wasn't there. She was standing at the museum entrance, way at the top of the steps, gesturing impatiently at me to come on. How'd she get there so fast? I have moments like that a lot when my brain falls asleep or something, and the next thing I know I've missed something as if a puzzle piece fell out of the universe and left me staring at the blank space behind it. The school counselor told me this was part of ADHD, my brain misinterpreting things. I wasn't so sure. I went after Mrs. Dodds. Halfway up the steps, I glanced back at Grover. He was looking pale, cutting his eyes between me and Mr. Brunner like he wanted Mr. Brunner to notice what was going on, but Mr. Brunner was absorbed in his novel. I looked back up. Mrs. Dodds had disappeared again. She was now inside the building at the end of the entrance hall. Okay, I thought, she's going to make me buy a new shirt for Nancy at the gift shop. But apparently that wasn't the plan. I followed her deeper into the museum. When I finally caught up to her, we were back in the Greek and Roman section. Except for us, the gallery was empty. Mrs. Dodd stood with her arms crossed in front of a big marble frieze of the Greek gods. She was making this weird noise in her throat, like, like growling. Even without the noise, I would have been nervous. It's weird being alone with a teacher, especially Mrs. Dodds. Something about the way she looked at the freeze, as if she wanted to pulverize it. You've been giving us problems, honey, she said. I did the safe thing. I said, yes, ma'am. She tugged on the cuffs of her leather jacket. Did you really think you would get away with it? The look in her eyes was beyond mad. It was evil. She's a teacher, I thought nervously. It's not like she's going to hurt me. I said, uh, I'll try harder, ma'am. Thunder shook the building. We are not fools, Percy Jackson, Mrs. Dodds said. It was only a matter of time before we found you out. Confess, and you will suffer less pain. I didn't know what she was talking about. All I could think of was that the teacher must have found the illegal stash of candy I'd been selling out of my dorm room. Or maybe they'd realized I'd got my essay on Tom Sawyer from the internet without ever reading the book, and now they're going to take away my grade. Or worse, they're going to make me read the book. Well, she demanded, ma'am, I don't. Your time is up. Then the weirdest thing happened. Her eyes began to glow like barbecue coals. Her fingers stretched, turning into talons. Her jacket melted into large, leathery wings. She wasn't human. She was a shriveled hag with bat wings and claws and a mouth full of yellow fangs, and she was about to slice me to ribbons. Then things got even stranger. Mr. Bronner, who'd been out in front of the museum a minute before, wheeled his chair into the doorway of the gallery, holding a pen in his hand. What ho, Percy, he shouted, and tossed the pen through the air. Mrs. Dodds lunged at me. With a yelp, I dodged and felt talent slash the air next to my ear. I snatched the ballpoint pen out of the air, but when it hit my hand, it wasn't a pen anymore. It was a sword. Mr. Brunner's bronze sword, which he always used on tournament day. Mrs. Dodds spun toward me with a murderous look in her eyes. My knees were jelly. My hands were shaking so bad I almost dropped the sword. She snarled, Die, honey! And she flew straight at me. Absolute terror ran through my body. I did the only thing that came naturally. I swung the sword. The metal blade hit her shoulder and passed clean through her body as if she was made of water. Hiss! Mrs. Dodds was a sandcastle in a powder power fan. She exploded into yellow powder, vaporized on the spot, leaving nothing but the smell of sulfur and a dying screech and a chill of evil in the air, as if those two red glowing eyes were still watching me. I was alone. There was a ballpoint pen in my hand. Mr. Brunner wasn't there. Nobody was there but me. My hands were still trembling. My lunch must have been contaminated with magic mushrooms or something. Had I imagined the whole thing? I went back outside. It had started to rain. Grover was sitting by the fountain, a museum map tented over his head. Nancy Bobafit was still standing there, soaked from her swim in the fountain, grumbling to her ugly friends. When she saw me, she said, I hope, Miss, I hope Mrs. Kerr whipped your butt. I said, who? I blinked. Our teacher, duh. I blinked. We had no teacher named Mrs. Kerr. I asked Nancy what she was talking about. She just rolled her eyes and turned away. I asked Grover where Mrs. Dodds was. He said, who? But he paused first, and he wouldn't look at me. 
So I thought he was messing with me. Not funny, man, I told him. This is serious. Thunder boomed overhead. I saw Mr. Brunner sitting under his red umbrella, reading his book as if he'd never moved. I went over to him. He looked up, a little distracted. Ah, that would be my pen. Please bring your own writing utensils in the future, Mr. Jackson. I handed Mr. Brunner his pen. I hadn't even realized I was still holding it. Sir, I said, where's Mrs. Dodds? He stared at me blankly. Who? The other chaperone, Mrs. Dodds, the pre-algebra teacher. He frowned and sat forward, looking mildly concerned. Percy, there is no Mrs. Dodds on this trip. As far as I know, there's never been a Mrs. Dodds at Yancey Academy. Are you feeling all right? And that's our story. Tomorrow, I will share with you um, a document, and we will continue working through this text together. Thanks for listening. Make sure you complete the assignment for today, and we will see you again.